Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe here, and uh, on this Wealth Wednesday, and uh, I hope all is well as we finish the Thanksgiving celebrations and we kind of move on towards the next stage, which is Christmas, for those that celebrate Christmas and the New Year. So, uh, been a good time, and uh, things are going well on my front in terms of the properties, the tenants are paying their rent, they're pretty much uh, doing what they're supposed to do, and everything's under control. And I'm looking to buy more houses, so I'm looking forward to buy my next house, hopefully very, very shortly. And therefore, I wanted to have today's session uh, really talk about the whole issue of contractors. I know that's what really scares a lot of people off. Um, you know, it's this whole idea of, oh, my God, am I going to be scammed by a contractor? Um, you know, what if they run off of my money? What if they finish, don't finish the job? If What if there's just constant drama? And, uh, and so we're going to kind of talk about that today. And the focus uh, of the session is going to be how to find a trustworthy and reliable contractor. So that's the topic today we're going to talk about is how to find a trustworthy and reliable contractor. And uh, also I'm going to provide you some uh, tips, uh, probably 18 tips uh, on how to do that. And uh, also some of the questions that you could ask and how to vet uh, prospective contractors. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, again, my name is Joe Asimo, Dr. Joe, and um, I've been an investor for a, for a little while, about 35 years in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, I buy houses, fix them up, and I rent them out primarily to Section 8 families. I love what I do. As the logo says up there, I build wealth and I do good by providing opportunities for families that otherwise would never be given the chance to live in a nice house, nice area and to rent from a great landlord. Okay, so let's get down to it. So uh, as I said before, we're gonna focus on uh, what you can do right um, and, uh, you know, to get the job done for your rehab project, okay? I know that you know, for the most part, in theory, it sounds simple. All you gotta do, you buy a house, it needs work, you just you know, pick up the phone, find some contractor, and uh, agree on a price, agree on the scope, and uh, you agree on the terms and they do the job and uh, they finish the job and you move on and find a tenant, move the tenant in and so forth. I mean, it sounds so simplistic. Uh, it, in theory, it should be. It should be, you know, tearing down walls, uh, you know, replacing electrical plumbing, HVAC lines, uh, installing kitchen cabinets, uh, retiling the floor. It's, it's pretty standard stuff. But the scary part is finding somebody who's actually going to do the work and do the work without a whole lot of drama, uh, a whole lot of back and forth and confusion and, um, you know, and so on. I mean, we all have the stories, you know, the, the contractor stories. I've had them, you know, the guys who, uh, you know, tear apart the kitchen and never return, leave the half, they leave the project half done. Uh, they give you a quote and then they start milking you. And next thing you know, it's twice the what they said three times and uh and they've got you almost like a barrel of a gun you know and or guys that about this one guys who show up to work drunk late never show up at all and uh you know they don't have a car so you got to take them over to the home depot um you know and so i mean i had some guy who anyway i don't want to tell you you know he literally didn't show up for work so i went to his house and uh i woke him out of bed and he said that the reason why he wasn't up was because the cat knocked over the alarm clock. And therefore, <laughs> so it was a cat that did it. Huh? And, uh, and so on. So, yeah, OK, it's very stressful. It's very expensive. And it's, um, you know, it's all that's in addition to the fact that when you do a rehab, especially a major rehab, you really don't know what's behind the walls. So a lot of surprises. Um, and uh, it's very intimidating. So, um, you know, you can essentially lose your sanity and obviously your budget as well. So I'm going to talk about lots of different tips I'm going to give you today. I'll put about 17 of them. Uh, so uh, I'll quickly go through all 17, and they range from, um, you know, you know, what to know before you start, uh, signing the contracts, negotiating, scope of works, and, uh, you know, making the final payment. I'm going to go through the run, run of the gamut, in terms of tips, suggestions, and lessons learned from my experience in doing this over the years. So let's get down to it, as they say. So let's have a look. So let's do the tip number one. Tip number one is know what you want before you get estimates, okay? 
I, I think that's quite important because if you don't know what it is that you want, then you could be easily uh, coaxed or, 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 you know, fooled, um, you know, uh, by somebody who talks a good game. So uh, what I think there is that you should start off with a plan, okay? Some ideas of what it is that you want done uh, as part of your renovations or upgrades or whatever. What do you want, you know? And take the time to, 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 to think that through and then write it down. Um, because if you know what it is, or if you have some ideas of what it is that you, what you want to do, it's easier for you to communicate to a prospective contractor rather than just saying, Hey, make this house look nice. Okay. Look nice means different things to different people. Uh, what I think is nice may be different from what you think is nice, maybe different from what the contractor thinks is nice. So you want to be able to say, no, okay. I want a new kitchen cabinet. Uh, I want this particular type or style of kitchen cabinet. I want this flooring remo removed and replaced with a different type of flooring, or whether it's ceramic, uh, vinyl plant, uh, luxury vinyl planks, or whatever it is. You know, you've thought it through. You've gone through the house. You've gone through the the rooms that you want upgraded, and of clearing your mind what it is that you want done. So you go through that and you document that. That way, when you actually sit down or meet with contractors, you know you have a, a better idea. And you're able to communicate and then you can have a good discussion uh, about, uh, you know, and, and so on. So know what you want uh, before you get estimates is my first tip. The second tip is, um, you know, ask, uh, ask other investors, uh, friends, relatives, co-workers uh, for references. You know, I mean, um, hopefully other, you know, people who have done this before uh, may have had some good experience or bad experience from a rehab. Uh, or if you want to, I would suggest is go to ARIA. That's a Real Estate Investment Association meeting. And they usually are scattered around uh, around the country. Uh, if you don't know, go to Bigger Pockets and uh, you know search for local uh, RIAs, or you can do a Google search to the local one. So if you go to these meetings, you usually find other uh, investors uh, who have experience working with different contractors. And they may be able to give you some referrals uh, or you can go to the local big box store like a Home Depot or Lowe's, go to the pro desk and they can probably give you some ideas of, uh, you know, potential uh, contractors, uh, referrals. Uh, I know some some guys, they kind of drive around the neighborhood and uh, look for people doing work and then approach uh, contractors that way. So but the idea is that, uh, you know, you want to, if possible, start off with referrals. Uh, people that uh, you trust, that you know, and who can suggest uh, some names. So if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, for example, uh, you know, I have some referrals of contractors. In fact, my contractors, the only ones I use, and I've used them for the last eight years and, um, you know, and so on. So uh, so that's the idea is to get some referrals. That's the tip number two. Ask other people for referrals and uh, before you start your project. And the tip number three is uh, once you've got some referrals, uh, I would suggest you try to get at least um, interview or meet with at least three, if possible, or more, uh, definitely more than one, and, uh, and so on. So that way, you know, you, uh, you get some different perspectives of, uh, you know, potential um, contractors. Uh, you can then discuss the scope of your project, uh, you can get a good feeling of whether, you know, you kind of the good energies are there if you kind of click and uh, whether you can sort of do business with this person. Uh, ask a lot of questions when you meet with them. And uh, this is where, you know, in step one, we talked about the uh, the uh, documenting the scope, uh, documenting what it is that you want. This is when you go through uh, when you actually meet with the contractors and uh, share with them what it is that you're looking for and have that discussion. So ask a lot of questions, get to know them, ask for a written proposal and an estimate, um, you know, and so on. And make sure that when you're getting quotes and uh, estimates that uh, they, you know, that you're comparing apples with apples. Um, you know, you document, for example, the type of materials that you want, the type of, um, you know, uh, fixtures that you're looking for. And, uh, and so on. So try to have detailed conversations rather than just a cursory one or two minute, you know, go through with each person um, and uh, ask all the questions that you can. And, uh, and I, I really do pay a lot to vibe or energy, as people say, karma. Um, you know, some people, you know, they're just not a connection. 
And uh, other people, there is a, a solid connection. That in itself is not enough, but it's I, I, I do believe in, in, in that. And uh, so, you know, see as you talk to this person, if they're the kind of people you want to do business with, if they have the same ethics that you have, if they have the same sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, attention to detail that you may have and uh, and so on. So, uh, so you know, and uh, the, the good thing is that as you speak to the contractors, you become more educated, you become more knowledgeable about what it's really gonna take to get the job done because they'll be imparting, hopefully you're having a conversation. So they'll be imparting their experiences to you. And, uh, and therefore you sort of uh, become more knowledgeable about the process and also the project that you intend to work on. So that's number three, uh, interview at least uh, three contractors. Tip number four is be realistic about availability. Um, good contractors may not be able to start immediately. I'm not, well, I won't say good contractors. Many, many contractors, they are, well, I may be working on other projects and therefore they may not be able to start exactly when it is that you want. Um, you know, so, because, you know, some really good ones are busy. Uh, they have consistent work and, um, you know, rather if they say, well, I'm gonna quit that job and, and come to you, uh, to me, that's a red flag because they could just as well quit your job and go to somebody else as well. So work with them in terms of uh, the start date, in terms of their availability and what works for you. And uh, some contracts can do multiple projects at one time if they have a big crew. Uh, some of them are just one man shows and a one woman show, one person show, I suppose. And uh, so they may not be able to do multiple projects or which is what I don't like. They, they come in the mornings, do yours for a couple of hours and then go somewhere else, do there for a couple of hours and go somebody else. And, you know, so they kind of spread themselves so thin and, uh, and, you know, the project just drags on and on and on and on. Okay. So, uh, discuss the availability and the ability to start your project when you, uh, what makes most sense for both of you. Tip number five is, uh, ask, uh, what will be done by subcontractors and what will be done by them? Uh, some contractors, uh, they sub, you know, they find other people to do some or all of the project. OK, so you're thinking that, uh, you know, uh, the person that you're meeting is going to do the work. But in fact, what they do, because they may be busy or whatever, they find somebody else to do the work and they take a little piece uh, of the uh, of, of the action. So you want to know, um, you know, uh, if they're using subcontractors, there's nothing wrong with using subcontractors. Uh, on my projects, my contractors use subcontractors, especially for the, the more uh, specialized uh, activities like electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and things like that, detailed carpentry. Uh, they may use uh, a, a subcontractor. But you, but you need to know, uh, you know if they're using subcontractors or whether they intend to do uh, their work all themselves. If they're using subcontractors, who's going to supervise those subcontractors? That's what you want to know. And that's the reason why, you know, it, it's good to know. That's my tip number five is uh, ask what will be done by the subcontractors. So let's kind of just summarize on, that, uh, on the one through five so far. Let's have a look. Number one is uh, know what you want before you get estimates. OK, so know what it is that you want before you start the project. Uh, get some idea of the scope uh, walk through the house yourself. And, um, you know, you should hopefully... If you have some ideas, then it's easier, easier for you to communicate. And number two is uh, ask other investors. Um, ask other and ask other investors, or realtors, or re relatives, or friends uh, for referrals. And tip number three is interview at least three people before you uh, select somebody. Uh, that way, you get different perspectives and different uh, inputs. Tip number four would be uh, be realistic about availability. And uh, some projects, uh, some contractors aren't able to start straight away. Uh, be understanding, but you can work it out. And uh, number five is ask about uh, whether they use uh, subcontractors or not. So that's the number five. Let's go to number six then. Number six is uh, choose the right contractor for the right project. Okay. And this is quite important. I've learned this the hard way. Uh, just because somebody can paint, um, you know, and do some drywall 
doesn't necessarily mean they can um you know do a major renovation um you know uh yeah uh, the analogy is probably a bad one just because somebody can cook uh and they're a great cook doesn't mean they can run a restaurant it's two different skill sets uh and so on so make sure you've got the right project or might right contractor for the right project and so aim to find contractors who routinely uh do what it is that you are asking uh, them to do and therefore they're comfortable they have experience and they know what it is that they talked about you're not going to be the guinea pig uh where they learn on your job and um you know, you really don't want to be the guinea pig. And uh, also you want to find out how big the company is. Is it one band or one person uh, shop or do they have several people in the business, uh, you know, and uh, and so on. So and, and can they handle multiple jobs? So if they have several projects going on, are they going to be so short staffed whereby you're the ones who get, uh, you know, fall by the wayside. So choose the right contractor for the right project and make sure that they have experience in what it is that it is that you want to do so if you if you've got an electrical project you don't want a guy who or a girl who you know all their their specialty is plumbing okay but they know a little bit about electrical uh but they focus on plumbing okay because uh you know it's not the right skill sets okay so that's number six number seven tip is um is check the licenses, complaints, and litigation history. Uh, hopefully, you know you're going to be uh, choosing uh, people who have li who are licensed, uh, who are able to because you know in order to to pull permits, a lot of projects require permits. Um, you got to be um, the person pulling the permits have to be licensed. Uh, so, for example, if there if you require uh, uh, electrical work. And it's a major electrical. It may require an electrical permit. If it's major plumbing work, uh, addition of bathrooms, kitchens, or whatever it is, it may require plumbing permits and so on. So you want somebody who's able to pull those permits. And uh, and typically, it's a licensed plumber or electrician or HVAC person who's authorized by the city or the state to pull those permits. So you want to check uh, the you know check their licenses, check for complaints. You know, um, so anyway, the permitting is typically the permits are issued by the state or the munis municipality where your property is located. Uh, in terms of complaints, check any boards. Let's, let's, a lot of these places have what they call disciplinary boards and or the Better Business Bureau or local court records to see if there's any problems or complaints about this person. Now, the only downside to that is that, uh, you know, it's very easy if you have, let's say my business is, business a and i get i do a lot of shoddy work and get a lot of complaints i could just as well close down a bit you know business a and create another one called business b and uh and use that now so if someone does a search on business p b uh business b looks fine there's no problem they don't know that i used to have business a and with all the uh the baggage associated with uh a so that's something um you may have to do a bit more deeper dive in uh to find out uh complaints uh and litigation from some of these folks because some of these folks are pretty savvy they know how to game the system and so it's your job to do necessary due diligence and uh, and so on so that's tip number seven and then tip number eight is check references uh obviously most people are going to give you references of people they're going to get good references from uh, obviously no one's going to give you, I'll call this person because, uh, you know, they don't like my work or they complain about me or whatever it is. So, so it's kind of a, you know, I don't put a lot of weight to that, but it's important that you do, uh, call the references. And if you do call the references, try to read between the lines and start asking probing questions about what they actually did and, uh, ask questions associated with, um, the cost, the, you know, were you satisfied with the workmanship? Um, you know, maybe have some photographs, if they can send some photographs, close-up photographs, not ones, you know, at the back of the room and because you, you want to sort of look for details. And if it's possible, maybe you can go there, arrange a time where you can go actually visit the property. That's going to be hard, but you never know. Uh, but references are important. And uh, whether they finish a the job on time, whether, they, you know, it's pleasant to work with, whether there was any disputes, uh, you want to know that if, if you can. 
Uh, okay, then move on to tip number nine. Tip number nine is uh, read online reviews. Um, you know, nowadays uh, there are a lot of online reviews about different businesses. Uh, there's these Angie's List. I think they call themselves Angie's now. These call Angie's List, uh, Home Advisor, uh, Yelp, Google. Uh, so you can kind of uh, you know read what other people have said uh, about this person, and uh, and then you look at the reviews yourself. Uh, based on that, you can sort of see you know is this the right person for your job, and um, and also you want to know is keep in mind that uh, when you're reading the reviews, um, reviews aren't a substitute for actually checking references because uh, sometimes people don't. You know, they may just say one, two words or not happy or great or whatever it is. That's that's fine. But uh, it's not a substitute for actually checking the references. And also a series of negative reviews, uh, especially, um, you know, consistent negative reviews. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a sign of a red flag, I would say. And uh, one negative review. Yeah, you may have a you know disgruntled person. But if there's consistently negative reviews, uh, especially you know, nasty comments, then I would definitely uh, be aware of that and put that into consideration uh, and so on. But reviews by themselves is not enough. You have to go beyond just the online reviews if possible. Uh, number 10 is uh, sign a detailed contract. Okay, so you've uh, you've decided that uh, you've done the due diligence on the prospective uh, um, contractor. And now it's time to actually put it into contract. So make sure that the contract is detailed. It, it clearly states roles and responsibility, the scope of the work, the payments, uh, the financials, um, you know, measures, metrics, uh, all those different performance, uh, you know, and so on. So uh, maybe I have another session on contractors, uh, contracts, uh, contractor contract, <laughs> uh, where I kind of go through some maybe my contract and. Um, you know, go into a bit more detail what's covered in those things. But anyway, uh, the kind of things that's typically in the contract are deadlines, payment schedules, uh, the materials to be used, uh, who will be who will provide materials, and is it you or is it the contractor? Roles and responsibilities. Uh, the only problem is that if it's not detailed enough, if it's you know, get one of those sort of one page or half a page things. That to me is it's it's. It's uh, it's too wishy-washy and it's too. It's going to create problems later on. So I prefer a detailed contract, and uh, you need to discuss how do you handle change. Uh, you know, if something unexpected uh, occurs, how do you handle that? Will cause um, scope changes, um, or if the uh, you know, you know, if you decide you want to do something that you uh, originally didn't think about. How do you handle that? Uh, the change orders, the you know, how do you handle change orders in terms of when there's a modification to the the scope of the project and things like that? But these are all things that needs to be included in the contract, and you need to discuss those things up front. Um, and I can give you a story whereby, um, you know, uh, I know one of the projects I had when I was a few years back, uh, I had a contractor who gave me a quote for a price. And it's very reasonable. Uh, in fact, it was quite cheap. So I was so happy that I could save this money and by using this contractor. And so I got into contract with him. And uh, lo and behold, you know where this is going. After the project starts, he says, well, you know, the estimate I gave you didn't include this. Well, so in order to do that, I'm going to need more money. And, uh, we, you know, so I give him some more, 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 more money and then... You know, continues and then you'll stop again. Well, the scope of the project didn't include that. I didn't include that in my bid. Uh, he wants more money. He wants more money and so, so on. So it's it, you know all those things were were was a, a very horrible experience. In fact, I ended up firing the that inspe uh, that contract in the end because we didn't really have a a, a, a contract. It was just almost verbal. Uh, with a few words about what he's going to do for the price and things like that. So try to get a detailed contract where you kind of address a lot of these uh, you know, potential issues uh, and so on. So, okay, number 11, uh, maybe I'll summarize it uh, on the five through 10. So I've gone through one through 
five. Uh, okay, one through five. Briefly, know what you want uh, before you get estimates. Number two is uh, ask other investors for referrals. Number three is interview at least three car um, potential contractors. Number four, uh, be realistic about availability. Number five is uh, ask uh, what work will be done by subcontractors. Uh, number six is choose the right uh, contractor for the right project. Number seven, check licenses, complaints, and litigation history. Number eight is check references. Check nine is uh, online reviews. And, and number 10 is sign a detailed contract. So that's where we are so far. So number 11 is get the proper permits. Permits, permits, permits. Uh, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to do a project, know what permits are required and get the right permits. Don't try and do those, do jobs if you require permits and you don't get them because um, uh, it's not good. I've tried that before when I started. It's just not worth it. Um, you know, you can get uh, fined if the neighbors complain and call the, the city or the county or the state on you. Uh, you can get to a lot of problems and they can put stop work orders on your project and uh, which could essentially stop your project for weeks or months. And on top of that, you have to then get the right permits and then you may have to pay a fine. So get the right permits if you if if um, you know if you're going to do that kind of project. Uh, so you, obviously your contractors should be able to advise you as to what con what permits are needed. Uh, given the scope of, of your project and um, you know and also be leery if they don't even talk about permits uh, it means that uh, either they want they're not licensed or they just don't want their work to be uh, reviewed by a third party uh, and so on so make sure that uh, you know you get the right permits because unpermitted work can cause you a lot of problems it can be very expensive and it could be very stressful uh, how do I know I've been there, done that, and I'm not doing it again? So uh, I learned my lesson many years ago. Uh, so all my projects are fully permitted and inspected. Um, that's just the way it is. Okay, number 12 is, uh, let's have a look. Uh, don't pay more than 10% of, to to of the total project uh, price before the job starts. Uh, yeah, be leery about uh, paying too much money up front. Um, because if you pay too much money up front, uh, there's a chance that the, I'm not saying it will happen, but there's a chance that the contractor could just take your money and run. And, uh, in that case, they're ahead of you. So they owe you money. Uh, so I, you know, sometimes they do require some money up front and, but try not to do more than 10% if you can. Uh, and you don't want them to use your money to be finishing off another project. So i.e., robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, a lot of these guys are very, uh, you know, hand to mouth existence. Cash flow is very, very terrible. And so if they get money from you, it may not be used on your project. It could be used on somebody else's project. OK, so um, so make sure that uh, what's it called? You don't pay too much up front. And uh, and the contract obviously should have the payment schedule um, and the triggers for payments in terms of milestones and completions and things like that. Uh, I understand if there's expensive materials that uh, are needed for your project. Yes, they, it's, it's reasonable to expect that you front some of that money. But just be careful how much you actually front. And I don't recommend anything more than 10%, especially at the beginning of the project. Uh, number 13 is uh, budget for unexpected costs. Yes, uh, these you, you will run into uh, some potential overruns. Uh, that's just how it is. Uh, I've never done a project where it came under budget. It normally never happens. Uh, so it, typical is that you run into scenarios that you weren't familiar with or didn't know, and therefore uh, it's going to cost you a little bit more. So make sure that uh, you know you budget for that and have some money set aside in reserves. Then the question becomes, how much should you set aside in reserves? Uh, I would say anywhere from 10 to 20 percent uh, should be set aside uh, just in case. And uh, that way, if you do run into a problem and you do run into a budget overrun, you're not sort of scurrying around trying to find money, uh, but you've set aside some money in reserves for that. Okay, so number 13, number 14 is negotiate the ground rules with your contractor before you start. What's the ground rules? Okay, uh, what are the hours? Are they going to work on the project? 
uh, what kind of notice uh, you know do they you expect from them? How are you going to handle change orders? How are you going to resolve disputes? Uh, dispute dispute resolution process. Uh, where will they park? Are they going to park at your property on the street or whatever it is? Uh, you know, uh, will the job be cleaned up every day? Uh, you know, or and so on. These are important things. These are ground rules. Uh, what hours do they work? And as I said before, and uh, when are how many people are going to be working on your project? Uh, you know, and so on. So these are some of the ground rules that you want to discuss. Um, you know, you may say, I want to visit the house once a week, or I want weekly reports or weekly photographs or videos of the status of the project. So these are things that uh, you want to discuss with your contractor. Uh, and it kind of leads on to number 15, which is um, talk to the contractor frequently. Um, you know, my projects, I usually meet with my contractors once a week, every Friday, uh, where we kind of talk about the project, how it's going, what are the problems we've encountered, um, you know, go through the financials and so on. So uh, if there's any issues, you want to be able to discuss that uh, before it gets real bad, before, it, you know, you don't want to sort of kick the can down the road. You want a forum whereby you can meet on a regular basis uh, and discuss the project and making sure the project's moving along uh, as expected and so on. It's a lot harder to fix problems later on, um, you know, especially, you know, um, if it requires that they're going to have to redo uh some of the things again okay uh silly thing example would be you know you thought that they you agree on the paint color and of a house let's say and uh and for some whatever reason yeah another color was painted uh if you had discussed that beforehand uh then obviously you could have saved yourself a lot of time if you didn't then it may require that the whole house be repainted uh but you don't have to micromanage them uh, but if you hire a, a, a good contractor, this is not a problem. They want to make sure that the, the channels of communications are open and, uh, and so on. So that's tip number 15. Number 16 is uh, get lien releases and receipts for products. So lien re releases is, um, you, know, uh, you know, if you, especially if you're using, if they're using subcontractors, if they don't pay the subcontractors, then technically, the subcontractors could put a what they call a mechanics lien against your house. Uh, so you may have paid the prime contractor, but the contractor didn't pay the subcontractors. Uh, and therefore, the subcontractors could put a lien against your house, even though you pay the contractors. So you want to make sure that uh, before you make major uh, uh, payments that you receive what we call lien releases. Uh, from the contractor, which and from the subcontractor, stating that they do not owe you any money, you you've paid them, and uh, and, and therefore you know you got it on paper that they're not going to place a lien against your house. Um, so that's for you know obviously major milestones in the house. It could be even for major purchases uh, of the house, um, you know, like appliances or whatever it is, and uh, and so on. So you want lien releases from the contractor. And also you want lien releases from the subcontractors as well. And uh, number 17, the final one, uh, is don't make, sh don't make the final payment until the job is 100% complete. Don't make the final payment until the job is 100% complete. Uh, that's, that's the reason. You don't want to, you know, you want to make sure that the final payment is for the job is done. Okay, so... Um, if you pay the final payment before the job is done, then there's a chance that once they get that money, uh, they can run off and not come back to finish the job itself. Um, you know, that's happened to me before. Um, you know, less reputable contractors, they don't care about their reputation. All they care about is hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, so if you pay them too early for the job, they may not finish it and they just move on to the next one and, uh, and so on. So I really don't, I do recommend that you don't pay the final pay, make the final payment until the job is done and you are 100% satisfied with the work and also you receive all the lien releases that we talked about before. Uh, and that way the final payment is the final payment for the entire job. So that's uh, number 17. I think my friends, that's, let me just quickly wrap through um, each of those once again. And let's have a look. Here we go. So number one, is uh, know what you want before you get estimates. Number two is uh, ask other investors, friends, relatives, 
uh, for referrals before you start the project. And number three is interview at least uh, three, uh, preferably more contracts before you start the job. Number four is be realistic about your availability uh, or their availability uh, because contracts can't always start on, you know, when you want them to start. Uh, number five is ask about the work, uh, what work will be done by them or what work will be done by subcontractors. And number six is choose the right contractor for the right project. You don't want an electrician doing a plumber's job and vice versa. Uh, you want people who are experienced in what it is that you want done. Number seven is check licenses, complaint and litigation history. And number seven is also check the references, um, you know, and uh, to make sure that they have a good reputation. You can see some of the uh, work that they've done, uh, read online reviews. And, uh, you know, there's things like uh, Yelp, uh, Angie's List, Google, um, you know, House, House Pro and so on. Uh, sign a detailed contract. Uh, not those one page or half a page still things. Make sure that the contract is detailed. It spells out all the the minutia of the uh, of the arrangement or the agree uh, of the terms that you're having in terms of payments, milestones, uh, hours of work, uh, number of people of the job, and uh, who's handling the materials and, and things like that. Number eleven is get proper permits for your job. Uh, I don't recommend that you do unpermitted work. Uh, it could be very expensive. Uh, especially if you get caught by the municipality that you're in, or if the neighbors file complaints against you, uh, get the per right permits and make sure that the, the project is inspected. Uh, don't pay more than 10% of the total job before the uh, uh, project starts. Uh, and number 13 is budget for unexpected costs. You will have overruns, uh, but make sure you set aside some monies in reserves for those days uh negotiate the ground rules for your agreement with your contractors and uh number 15 is uh what's it called talk to the contractor frequently uh make sure you have a channels of communication open and uh, number 16 is get lean releases and receipts for your projects um you know when you've uh what's it called made payments make sure you get lean releases from the contractor and also from the subcontractors and then finally number 17 don't make final payments until the job is 100% complete. So that, my friends, is, uh, you know, most of the, what I want to talk about today. So, you know, but essentially, I just summarize, um, you know, the right general contract for your business is so important. It's really, really important that you get the right person to do your job because the wrong person is just a headache. Uh, you want someone who's got the paperwork in order. They've got professional um, price quotes. They're clear. Uh, an understanding and uh, but going through the steps which I've just discussed uh, I know I, I I gave 17 points these are based on my experience uh, this is how I do it and uh, but you too can do it it's it, it is scary it is a little intimidating but uh, if you go through the steps that I just described uh, above I think you'll be fine and um, I think you'll be okay so it shouldn't be too much of a uh, a headache and heartache and grief, um, you know, in trying to find trustworthy and reliable contractors. So hopefully use those tips and uh, that will help you find trustworthy and reliable contractors. So that's and done. I hope that uh, this was helpful and I'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye for now.